Good morning. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this webinar with Sybil Macbeth and Jana Reese on praying in color and how this new way of praying came to be and continues to change so many lives. My name is Rachel McHendry and I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. A recording of today's conversation will be available later on to share with anyone who couldn't make it. And we'll also let you know how to get copies of all of Sybil's Praying in Color books. Please take a moment to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and feel free to submit any questions you may have for Sybil throughout the conversation and we'll hope to get to everyone by the end of the hour. So just by way of introduction, Sybil Macbeth is a doodler, dancer, and former community college math professor. She combines her years of experience in the mathematics classroom with her lifelong love of prayer to lead workshops and retreats around the country. As a confessed non-artist, she marvels at God's sense of whimsy and humor in giving her a way to pray through drawing. Since 2008, Jana Reese has been an editor in the publishing industry, primarily working in the areas of religion, history, popular culture, ethics, and biblical studies. She is a senior columnist for Religion News Service, and she has authored or co-authored many books, including Flunking Sainthood. Thank you so much for spending this time with us this morning, Sybil and Jana. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hi, Jana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, Sybil, it is it's great that I get to do this because we've been friends for a long time, and I got to attend a Praying in Color workshop that you did when you came through Cincinnati and got to see you in action. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that you can recreate that a little bit because uh, people who don't have access to these live uh, wonderful gatherings that you used to do, like hopefully we'll someday get back to doing live gatherings, uh, we can take advantage of technology and they can get to know what it means to pray in color this way, this, this very beautiful technology video way where we're being joined by people from all over. So thank you for talking to me today. All right, well, let me get started saying we just had the 10th anniversary of Praying in Color and this book has just come out with it, which is a revised and expanded edition of the original Praying in Color. Um, so can you tell us how all this got started with Praying in Color, what it is and how, what it means to communicate with God through doodling your prayers? Okay, so probably mm, at least, no, longer than that, almost, almost 20 years ago, I had a whole bunch of people and my family and friends who were all of a sudden diagnosed with terrible kinds of cancers, like lung cancer, breast cancer, um, brain cancer. And I kind of lost my words in prayer. I mean, it's like, how many times can you say, um, please God, you know, let Peter feel no pain and please heal Charlotte's melanoma and let Sue live long enough to see her children graduate from high school. and. <clears throat> they just felt puny. And I'm sure God was fine with those little puny prayers. And Teresa of Avila calls them arrow prayers. You're just kind of shooting off these little prayers all day long. But they've, I don't know, I just felt kind of like a prayer flunky. So I am a doodler and I, I am not an artist. I can't draw a cat. I have huge shame about art because my mother and grandmother were artists. And, um, so, but I love to doodle. I like to draw abstract shapes. So I thought I'd show you a little bit. So um, if we go to slide five, and um, I think Dan's going to have a little screen sharing. A little screen sharing. I can't see it. Is it there? OK. I think it's starting. <clears throat> OK, so one day I was on my back porch. This is at the end of a semester. And I started to doodle, which is like, and I like abstract things. And then. I sort of added some more things to it. So if you click again, yeah. And then I added some more shapes. And all of a sudden I realized I'd written the name Sue in the middle of one of the doodles. And Sue was my sister-in-law who had stage four lung cancer and still had uh, sort of college, high school age kids. So her name appeared and I continued kind of just to sit with it and added, started adding color to it. And <clears throat> as I did that, all of a sudden I realized, you know, I think I'm praying for Sue. 
I'm, I don't have words and God doesn't need me to have words, but I'm being with her and I'm really sort of letting her go. And while I was doing this, I was no longer worrying for her because I really felt like I had released her into God's care. And, you know, if words came to me when I was doing this, I'd pray them, but I didn't force words to come because I really felt like Sue and God and I were kind of present together. So then I figured that if I could pray for Sue that way, and we go to the next slide, then I could also pray for the other people on my prayer list. Peter had uh, brain cancer and Julia had breast cancer and Charlotte had melanoma. And then at the time I had a teenage son and I was always praying for him. So that's how he ended up on there. Um, and so not only had I had this kind of quiet time in which I was really letting go of these people, but afterwards I had kind of a visual record of those, that prayer. And during the day that image would come back to me. It was almost like it had planted a digital image in my brain. And when it did, I could either release them again into God's care, or I could send off my little one-liner prayers. So um, mm. that's, and then after I'd been doing it a while, this is the next screen, I decided that I, um, I always wanted to start with God first, like get, in, invite God into this. I mean, I felt like God was there, but to kind of intentionally ask God to be present when I was doing this. And then I would, after that, I would pray for the other people on my list. Mm -hmm. So and, you're putting God in the center and then the other prayers are constellation around. Yeah, well, that's kind of how I do it. But people have, have come up with all different kinds of ways. That's the kind of cool thing about it. And, you know, most of the stuff is not, this is like, there's color involved and there's little lines, but they're basically just doodles. Um, and it's also, you know, it was much less, I had many less distractions than I usually do with prayer. Cause I think I was inviting my body into the prayer mm. and, um, and, you know, just the action of my hand helped to settle me and to, to get still on the inside while I either waited for words or waited for, the silence that I knew was that, you know, uh, be still and know that I am God. Um, I did, I still do get distracted. So there's this other thing, I, this other little thing that I do is I have a little my favorite part, actually little yeah. box um, yeah. that I put my distractions in. And actually, no matter how you pray, it's not bad to have a little box That's of cool. distractions. Free parking, like this is free parking for all yeah. of the random thoughts that, yeah. And the That's a friend of mine calls it the parking lot for distractions. So, um, you know, I like, like having that. And, and sometimes the irony is that what I need to pray about sometimes is in the distractions. Mm, interesting. Okay. So anyway, so that's kind of how it, it got started. And then I just continued, you know, to do that. It, so it started off as a way to pray as an intercessory prayer form. Okay. And then it's morphed into different things. But, you know, I, I, I can show, we can show some examples of different, of some prayers. So if we look at like uh, slide 11. Um. <clears throat> While we're waiting for that, let me just ask you, um, how did this become a book? I mean, do you want to talk about that now or just wait for a minute and? Um, let's show these four slides, okay. Um, so these are, they're just, this for, the one on the left, as I'm looking at it, says prayers. That came in the midst of the morning pages I, that I do every morning, where I write three pages every morning. I've been doing that for at least 20 years. And so the kernel of praying color came that way. And then the one on the right also has a scripture verse sort of woven into there. We can go to the next screen. These are just um, um, partly to show that it's not fancy art. Um, and then you know, some, like I use the name, G, you know, I asked Jesus into the prayer. And then on the right, you can, if you can look at those things, you can tell they're actually cookie cutters. So if you're afraid to draw, you can trace around stuff too. So, and then next screen. And you don't have to play in color, pray in color. I don't think of myself as a colorer. I think of myself as a doodler. And then I add color, but it doesn't even have to have color. Um, you can just be with a pen or whatever. And then maybe one more slide. 
And you know, sometimes people, the one on the left is by my friend, Connie uh, Denninger, who has, uh, who started a group called Visual, uh, Visual Faith Ministry. And she, I think, maybe stamped the, the uh, verse in there, but, and then she doodled all around it with the names of people that she, that she has. And then the one on the right is something I did, which is way more complicated than most of the things I usually do. But if my hand, if I still want to stay with the person or, or whatever, I just keep, keep drawing or doodling. It looks like from the one on the right that you are praying not only for people on the bottom, but also situations in the world. Maybe are you praying the news as you encounter? I have like done that. that. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, beautiful. Now you mentioned uh, your morning pages, which I'm guessing comes from Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I did that too a number of years ago. I'm sure that some of the people who are joining us, thank you for coming from all over the world. Um, have also done the artist's way. And it's very interesting to hear that that practice of the morning pages that you've stuck with it for one thing, which I have not done, and uh -huh. that it helped to give rise to this practice. Uh -huh. I, you know, it, you, you do it first thing in the morning, you write three pages, you don't edit. And I like it because even my, my prayer concerns come up in that. Whereas if I just sat down and sort of created a little prayer time, I would have started to edit you know, in my mind. So this is what you need to hear today, God. But in the morning pages, when I'm just blathering, stuff comes up that I can then offer in prayer, so. Okay, excellent. Thank you for showing us that. So let me go back to my question about how did this start to be a book? I know that Phyllis Tickle, who, is, who was another Paraclete author, had a lot to do with that and kind of hooking you up with Paraclete, which has been your publishing house. Right. Right. Um, when, I mo when I moved to Memphis from Virginia Beach in 2004, I had been praying in color for about a year. I mean, that, have, that was my main way to pray for other people. But I had only told two people. I had told my husband and I showed another friend because I wasn't sure if it was spiritually legal. You know, like, this is kind of weird. You're breaking but the law. I'm breaking the law. So when I moved to Tennessee, the only person I had ever heard of that lived in Tennessee was Phyllis Tickle, who I had met when she keynoted a conference. So I wrote to her and, and we went and had lunch and I took my prayer journals with me and I, I, I kind of hesitantly showed her what I was doing. And she goes, you're going to write a book. And for those of you who know Phyllis Tickle, she's pushing six feet. She was pushing six feet tall and very imposing. And all you do when she tells you you're going to write a book as you say, yes, ma'am. And, and you write, you start writing. And, uh, and then she hooked me up with um, Paraclete and John Sweeney. So. Okay. Well, thanks for telling that story. Now there have been several of these offshoots from the original book. And I have a little sampling here of the Sybil oeuvre, the Sybil Macbeth <laughs> Praying in color, drawing a new path to God, which is this, you know, very short, accessible, almost pockety edition of this. This is called the portable edition. This is the one that I use most. This is the pray and color coloring book where people can, you've, you've provided kind of a template already mm -hmm. and that people can fill it in. So you <clears> say <throat> not artistic. I am so beyond not artistic that I really appreciate having the template. I think we should show your your uh, your work. Oh, okay. We can, yeah, I, I provide a couple. Then there's this okay. empty journal that people can use. There's also one called Praying. It fell down to the floor. That is in no way, you know, a statement. Praying, <laughs> in, which is intended for uh, a hands-on practice for men. So that's interesting that there's like something in the series for the dude bros. Um, and other stuff too. And then this has been so successful that you just have this uh, expanded edition with 50% more material. That's pretty great. I'm just so pleased, I guess, that obviously <laughs> I'm not the only person with whom this has struck a nerve. Yeah. And thanks. Uh, you know, one of the things I do in the, the new book is um, I, I think I give more ways for people who are sort of art phobic or art challenged like I am t to start doing this. Like for one, I have a section on how to doodle or doodling vocabulary. And then, um, and, and so different ways to, to start it. And 
Um, I also like did find, I don't have any trouble doodling, but I know that there are people that do and that Pray in Color book did that. And Jenna sent me a couple examples of the ones she had done. So um, if we go to, let's see, 16, slide 16. So the, the one on the left was the template and then Jana did the prayer on the right for, she was praying for friends and family members. Is that, is that right? Yes. So um, this is specifically, it looks like prayers for healing. And as I look at the names, this was from last summer. Um, these are all people that I love who have been afflicted with various things. And it was interesting to me to hear you say that that's kind of how this practice began when you were praying for someone who was sick and you felt like so many people in your life um, were dealing with cancer at that time. And that's kind of where this also came from. I tend to bring my pray and color book with me to church. And so often, I don't know if that was a Sunday, June 16th, but often I'm doing this on Sunday while I'm sitting in church. So, you know, one of the things that struck, strikes me looking at yours too, Jana, is just because it's a coloring page in some ways doesn't mean that you can't do your, add your own doodly stuff to it. Cause you've really, really augmented it. It's very playful and. Um... No one has ever found anything that I did artistically to be augmenting anything. So I will take that compliment. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, show the, um, let's do the next slide. Let's okay. see what that is. Okay, you, oh, and so what, tell us, so there's the template, blank template on the left, and what? Yeah, um, so the one on the right was um, my husband, you know, out of all the possible midlife crises a man could be having in his late 40s, decided to start running marathons, and I'm like, great, that is the best possible <laughs> midlife crisis. And this was um, a page that I made for him and I put it in his little suitcase on the day of his first marathon. So these are the things that I'm praying for, for him to have health and strength and stamina. I also put help down there at the bottom, just in case he needed to ask for help that he would be empowered to do so, because sometimes I think that's a problem <laughs> for people. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> as I was praying this and, and say the same with the other one, I find it to be so helpful and grounding just to have something to do with my hands while I am thinking my, you know, thinking my blessing on whoever it is that I'm praying for. Sometimes I will, if I'm praying for different people, like in the last one, choose colors that remind me of that person or uh -huh. have some kind of symbolic meaning as I'm praying for them or little designs that make me think of that person. And it just comes to me in the moment, typically. It's not something that I'm, I'm thinking of. Um, here, my friend Melissa, in this one, you can see the nicknames of her children are all around her huh. in that one. That's what that means. And the same thing with Eden. The, the names of her family members are surrounding her, and I envision them surrounding her with love and, and caring for her. So I, you know, I think of prime and color as sort of what you said is helping. It keeps me in the chair. Yeah. Instead of, and Jana has written a wonderful book called Flunking Sainthood. And it's about how she took a, a, pra a spiritual practice every month and decided to do it for a month and then really blew it. Right. Or, I mean. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty every much. Yes, consistently, but this one wasn't one of them. So maybe if we had had praying <laughs> at that time, it would have been called flunking sainthood for 11 months and exceeding just that one time. <laughs> but you, don't you say something about, oh, I'm praying and, oh, look, there's a squirrel. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the, oh, look, a squirrel person. And when Rachel was introducing you at the beginning and, and said that you were, you know, someone who loves to pray, I've not had that experience for most of my life that, um, I tend to think of prayer as an obligation, something that I should be doing and probably ought to be enjoying, but usually I'm not uh -huh. enjoying that much. And this helps me to actually enjoy it and to feel so, you know, wrapped up in the love that I feel for other people as I'm praying for the intercessory, praying in color, um, to feel some of that love from God. And it's such a better experience. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, That's great. All right, so tell me more about the reception of this. Were you surprised by how much it took off? Because this is fantastic, but you know, it has spoken to so many people and you've been leading 
workshops and retreats all over. I guess it was sort of affirming to know that I was not the only person who had trouble with prayer. Mm -hmm. So when I started doing workshops, one of the things that struck me is I've done them for all different kinds of, you know, Christian denominations, Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, um, Lutherans, and, uh, uh, the Salvation Army, which I didn't even, before I did it, didn't even realize they were actually um, a denomination. And, and one of the things that happens in these workshops is that we never talk about, well, what do you believe about this? And what do you believe about that? And what do you believe? We're all just wanting to make contact with God, if you want to. So we're all, we focus on how do we communicate with God? How do we sit in the presence of God? And all that other stuff just, my experience in the workshops is that that stuff just goes away. Um, so I've met people that I never probably would have met in sort of my own normal circles of travel. And I've just been so grateful for that. Um, that's, that's been really pretty wonderful. So, so. You know, one of the other things that I've discovered when I'm, when I've, I've done this, I do, when, when I do workshops, I do, I do movement things with people mm -hmm. and I do some playful things with people because I, I realize that um, play and pray are almost the same word physically, right? They vary by R and L, but they also have a lot of other things in common, I think, is that when we play, we kind of let down our hair and we're willing to be silly and Mm. sort of surrender to the moment and we become vulnerable and sometimes we let a leader take us to places we wouldn't normally go and to me that's kind of what prayer is it's about becoming childlike and surrendering and being vulnerable and letting God lead you to some places you didn't know you were going to go and sometimes your knees get skinned you know mm -hmm. just like it, it's risky to, it's risky to pray you, you just don't know where you may end up going with that prayer or where you'll be called to go. So I, I like the idea that prayer is both it's serious, but it's also playful. And um, yeah, pray, like pray, it's prayful and prayerful and playful. So. And sometimes we just don't pay enough attention to that part of, of the spiritual life, the playful aspect of it. And the, you know, the, the, the willingness to experiment, to maybe bend or break the rules you talked about, feeling at the beginning like this might have been even illegal, uh, a, a forbidden practice. I hope that that sensibility has gone away over time. But, um, but that's a very interesting thing that you noticed at the beginning, that it yeah. felt transgressive somehow to be able to actually enjoy praying. Mm -hmm. You know, the the few sort of criticisms that I've heard are like, um, you know, if you're if you're get if you're being quiet, then that can allow if you're not saying all the words that we're used to saying, then you you know, then you're making yourself vulnerable to bad things. And I'm like, tell us I think God asked us to be still and know that he, you know, know that God is God and that that when we create a platform and we're surrounding ourselves with prayer that um, I don't feel, maybe I'm being naive, but I don't feel vulnerable to a negative kind of attacks or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call them. So. Mm. <clears throat> so one of the things that I really appreciate about this being a journaler is that this is, it functions for me almost like a prayer journal. Like when I was going back through that book to see what examples um, I might have that we could share that weren't, you know, too private to share. Uh -huh. um, I was reminded of, oh, this is what I was praying for two years ago. And uh, here is how that worked out one way or the uh -huh. other. And that in, in itself is also a very grounding aspect of the practice that you, you have a record of where you've been spiritually, what, what you were thinking about, who you were lifting up mm -hmm. in prayer. Yeah. Do you sort of a spirit? It can be, you know, sometimes I've liked to use a big calendar. And so, you you know, you pray on each calendar. And I use those a lot during Advent and Lent, but you can also use them on a daily basis. And then you go back and you think, I mean, it is sort of like a spiritual, visual, spiritual autobiography. 
you know, you can see it. And, be, and because you've done it with your hand, you may even remember, oh, I remember doing that. And I remember I was praying for Beth and um, do I need to call Beth? How is she doing? So it really is sort of a record as well as your own sort of spiritual, you know, autobiography. Mm -hmm. There's that sort of prompt to possibly follow up or to act on a, a feeling that you might have had about that person. Yeah, or to, to bring them to prayer again, you know, if, if it was a if it was a person that you're praying for. Mm -hmm. So a couple of the comments here in the chat room, someone has said, uh, you know, thank you so much, love, love, love this method of prayer. Someone else said to you, I'm going to read this, please claim your identity as an artist, as an act of love and affirmation to all those who are using visual marks to make beauty and meaning. If that is not art, what is? Like, Thank you. Wow. Yeah, you. I know. Because I, I, I said I, I, I had a psychologist friend once who said, for the next week, every time somebody says uh, something nice to you, you're supposed to say, Thank you. Please tell me again. And really? sort of to claim that um, the artist piece. Thank mm -hmm. you, whoever said that. <laughs> You know, um, Sybil and Jana, there's another question here in the Q&A bar that relates to what you're talking about right now. Iabo says, doodling is art. I think it pulls from a different part of the brain. And although it may not be publishable, I love this work because it gives us access to our awareness. Why do you not call it art? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think I don't call it art. Be, for one thing, because I used to have so much shame about the fact that I couldn't, my mother and grandma, my mother was a sculptor and an oil painter and my grandmother was a painter and I've really never been able to draw anything literal, right? So I guess I also don't, I often say I use art for prayer, mm. but that I'm not an artist. And I guess because I, I want to invite people who also have the same misgivings and fears about you know, if you, you can't use art unless you know what you're doing. But, but this has given me the permission to use the tools of an artist. And, um, and just to invite other people in who, you know, have felt that sort of um, inadequacy. Mm. So I guess I, could, I guess I should call it art, but I also don't want to terrify people. That's true. Art seems like a, a sort of high barrier of entry, whereas doodling is more accessible. It's something that most of us feel that we can do, just have done since we were kids. You know, the well, other no, thing- I've said I'm a good, I've gotten to be a good doodler, whatever. <laughs> some of, you know, and some of my doodles are kind of fun and interesting and um, maybe even publishable, but, <laughs> or, um, yeah. but- well, speaking of the artist tool, Sybil, um, another question from Linda Nelms about the nuts and bolts of it, really. She says, what do you use for coloring? Crayons, colored pencils, colored pens? Um, you can use anything, you know, you can use, and crayons, I find, are very difficult to manipulate. I know that's the first thing we give kids, but I feel like I have no control with crayons, so they're out for me. Um, <clears throat> I tend to use a black pen, like a a roller ball pen to do outlines with, and then I will either use colored pencil or markers. And I tend, to, this is sort of my guilty pleasure, is I have these markers and they're pretty nice and they really are art markers. But, but you can, you know, Crayola's super tips from, you know, are, are really good uh, washable markers and Sharpies are good and, you know, you can, and then you can also use colored pens. I don't, there's no, there's no rules about it, really. It's like, find out what works for you. And, you know, you don't have to put God in the center of the page. Put something, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of like I teach things that way just because then it's easier. Then you can, you've got a, a, a boundary and then you can break the boundaries once you do that and figure out what you like to do. Okay. I don't know if that answered the question or not. <laughs> I think it did. So I'm not seeing the questions in the chat room. Maybe those are coming through on YouTube. Um, they're, they're here in the funny little Q&A button. It's an interesting comment on what you were just talking about by um, Ellen Gadbury, who made one of those comments about art and being an artist. She says, that's fair. 
we have fantastic opportunities to expand our culture's two narrow definitions of art. Acts of creativity equals imago dei. Mm, nice. so you know, and there have been a lot of people who have been um, doing the same stuff at, at, um, as I have, or, at, or have, I don't know if they started doing things at the same time I do, but there are a lot of people who are um, uh, drawing in, in their Bibles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, used to be, oh, don't ever put a mark in your Bible. That's illegal, you know, or, or whatever. But now they're, there's Bible, they call it Bible journey or illustrated faith. And as I said before, my, my friend Connie, who has this thing, she and some other people called visual faith ministry. It's all about different ways to incorporate drawing and coloring and even stamping and you know craft w within it and that's a little complicated for me but it's just because i don't like to have a lot of stuff but it's really spoken to some people um go if you can go to i just want to show a couple examples of it. Uh, slide 26 these are some examples of praying in your bible or praying in the margin of scripture lisa hickman is a woman who wrote a book called praying in the margins and originally it was about writing lots of words and things but the, you know this is how it's expanded this is from my friend connie and um she really does a lot of things with letters and all but it's like wow you can actually write on on your bible and um why don't you go to the next screen as well? And these are very beautiful. I find this a little intimidating because um, it's 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 so beautiful. But when you actually look at it, they're very simple kinds of things with color. And then one more. This is this was my attempt. One Lent, I think. The next screen, too, is I went through Genesis and I didn't have the nerve to write on the words, but I did these little doodles. And now when I look at those doodles. I can tell you what the story is. So what it's mm. done is it's helped to reinforce the story. You know, the thing on the very, the far, I don't, I think you're looking the same. The far right is about the seven years of famine and the seven years of, of abundance. And then there's the code of many colors. And um, so I think it's really wonderful. I, I don't do this sort of on a regular basis, but um there are a lot of co uh, communities on Facebook and that, that do that. Um, I love that. That's, yeah. that was beautiful. Awesome. Jim, um, there's a couple questions, Sybil, going back to what you were saying about the morning pages. Sean Mossel says, please remind me about the morning pages. I would love to look up that author. And mm -hmm. another attendee says, I'm interested that you do this in church. Does Sybil do this as part of or at the end of her morning pages practice? Do you mind talking about those morning pages? Um, the morning pages were from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. It's probably at least 30 years old now. And it was practices. Um, and, and she uses the word artist in a very loose way. You can be the uh, CEO of a company, but you're, you're tapping into your creativity and the artistry in you. And one of the things was get up every morning and the first thing you do is you write three pages in a journal. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm gonna be so embarrassed. And then she says, and don't read anything you've written for at least six weeks. So I thought, I can, you can do anything for six weeks, right? So I, I did it every day for six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, I wasn't even interested in looking back at what I wrote because it's not about writing great stuff. It's about sort of emptying your subconscious when you get up in the morning, of all the things that have, have been brewing from the previous day and, the, and during the night. And, I just, and the kernel of praying in color came in that for me because I went back to a journal once and I thought, wow, it, it, was, it was really in there. And so I kind of done it sub, a little bit subconsciously. And I just think it's a wonderful practice and I hate doing it a lot of mornings that I might write I hate this. I don't want to be doing this. Blah, 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 blah. But I keep doing it. And then I do, and then I'll start to write bigger so it'll take less time. <laughs> it's, it's the artist's way and it's Julia Cameron. And then the other question is, um, yeah, sometimes it comes up for me in the morning pages. Um, sometimes I do it at different times of the day, praying in color or, um, and it's more for me a lot. I. I do a lot of blessing prayers 
these days, partly because a lot of my friends, I guess as I'm getting older, I have friends who are dying and friends who are, um, are ill. And so I like doing blessing prayers for them. And the difference between me, for me between an intercessory prayer and a blessing prayer is the blessing is kind of sort of offering a direct prayer to somebody. It's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm being an agent of God and covering you with, so, you know, the, the, uh, the prayer in scripture, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious upon you. And look. So I'll often pray, say, say things like loving God, sur may, may loving God surround you. Um, may the weeping God comfort you. May the, so I do a lot, you know, I do that. That's what sort of I'm focused on. Jana, talk about a little bit about you doing it in church. Somebody okay. asked the question about doing it in church. I do it during sermon on sermon notes sometimes. Yes. Jenna, well, so. yeah. The reality is that church for me is not often very stimulating. And <laughs> I find, I'm just being honest. I find that I can actually pay attention more when I am doing this practice than if I'm just sitting there and letting my mind wander. Because I, you know, I do, I do pay enough attention that I know what is being said, um, but I'm able to, to focus spiritually much more rather than just thinking, oh, what are we having for lunch? Um, which, <laughs> Look at that squirrel. <laughs> yes, right, exactly, squirrel out the window. Um, yeah, and sometimes I did an experiment. I was listening to, I think it was called On Faith at the time, Krista Tippett. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I was going to doodle the whole time I was listening to her. And so I just kind of did these little funny doodles. And I don't think I was coloring. I was just taking pads. And at the end of the thing, I went back and I looked at it and said, oh, when I was doing that, she was talking about this. When I was doing that, she was talking about this. And it was like in direct contrast what our teachers used to say. You know, don't, if you're doodling, you're not paying attention. And I think that's just, you know, crazy. And, you know, and for people who have said to me, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't really the right way to teach children to pray or adults to pray because it's not biblical. And, and I'm thinking, you know, if somebody said to you, okay, you can't do math the way your parents or grandparents did it, then tough luck. You just don't get to learn how to do math. We... Now we consider learning styles and we just, we would try anything to get our children to learn how to do math. And I think, why is that any different than prayer? Well, I know, I'm just going to interject and say that using the Bible as the, as the um, authority here is a little problematic because what the Bible says about children is that parents can stone them if they're disobedient. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we want to be, yeah. Mitigate that a little bit. You were saying. Yes, there, there are so many questions that's so interesting about how to teach praying in color to children. Um, I'll, I'll try to sort of consolidate them. Joy mm -hmm. says, I'm a children's ministry leader. I'm just wondering about any advice you could give as to how to engage kids with this practice. And there's questions about um, small, small children, middle school children, high school children. Um, do you mind talking about that for a minute, Sybil? Um, you know, quickly, I, on my website, prayingincolor.com, there's a handouts page. And it gives you ideas for teaching praying in color to a group of adults. And then it has one for kids. And one of the things I've noticed about children is they can, um, if you I use often use a little egg timer and say, um, I mean, it, if you look at it's gonna, it would take a long time, but I use an egg timer because it's very visual. And I say for three minutes, what I want you to do, somebody has told us they want us to pray for their brother, Johnny, okay? So, and you help them write the word Johnny if they can't do it and just get them to draw and concentrate, you know, and, and for three minutes or two minutes, whatever the timer, we'll pray for Johnny and this is quiet time. And I've been astonished that I don't usually do it with anybody under five, but that, you know, five, even the four-year-olds sometimes, the five to eight-year-olds can be as quiet as long as you want, as long as they know there's a boundary. And adults too, adults like a boundary. We're gonna do this for three minutes because otherwise they're gonna think, when is she gonna call time, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think boundaries, you know, Mr. Rogers sort of 
this is what we're going to do and this is what, how we're going to do it. Yeah. And uh, I, I found that teenagers, the, more, the longer you do it with them, the more intimate they get about what they're willing to share. So um, I also fantastic. want to point out that there is a whole praying in color book that's just for kids. I forgot to- That's it. for kids to read, right. And if you read the how-to part of the, the new praying in color for adults, it, would, it also does it step by step so that you can um, then, then adapt it to whatever group that you're talking about. No. Absolutely. There's um there's several questions here, um, Sybil, which what you're saying I think would tie into this. Any tips on leading this study on Zoom, uh, specifically for teenagers, but I think people looking for um, how to keep their church groups together and active through praying in color together, but on the computer. You know, I don't think it would be much different than doing it, um, you know, if you were doing it in a workshop setting, except that, you know, you would, you might have some time of silence, et cetera. And that wouldn't be all bad. I mean, there, I mean, I think there's real power in a whole group being silent and quiet together. And um, so, so once again, I would say, I look, look at the handout. It's free ideas for leading a praying and color workshop. Look at that. And I think it could be easily adapted to zoom. And I think that may, I'm, you know, might be doing something like that later in the summer also. Um, Sybil, can you remind everyone of what your website is again? And I'll include it in the chat bar too. It's just prayingincolor.com. Thank you. All lowercase, all, you know, one, one done is one word. And there's a, I, you know, I post ideas on the, on a blog that I do and I post, um, do we, do we have any time left? Oh yeah. Okay, I, I was going to show one thing sort of for, that's kind of in the book. It's sort of for the art phobic, um, which actually comes out. If you could go to um, screen number, I think it's 19. No, that's not right. I can't, 19. Yeah. This is, so, one way to do to pray in color if you're not sure you can you know you don't i don't know how to draw and all that kind of <laughs> garbage that goes through your head is to write your word that you you know the who do you pray to god jesus loving loving one healers holy spirit whatever write the word and then just draw some lines out of it right and then just choose two different shapes i'll say shapes or strokes and in this one, I used U's or arcs and V's. So all I did was start drawing a bunch of U's and V's. So if you go to the next screen, so see they're V's and they're U's and you can double them or you know you can triple them. And you start to make this kind of rosette that grows from outside. And what I, one of the pr kind of prayers I talk about in the book is, uh, um, prayers of just lingering with God. Like I don't have any particular agenda, but I just want to, I just need to sit with God. Okay. And if I try to do that by sitting with my hands in my lap, or even I'm not a good centering prayer person, but anyway, so you just start drawing and getting still, and then you keep doing that. And there's an, and then next, show the next screen, please. And while you're doing that, you can, you know, if somebody comes to you that you want to pray for, you add their name, you know, and I was do doing this kind of yesterday. And then, you know, you can call around it if you want to, and then just keep expanding it. But, you know, even if you're not an artist, this, they really, I think they come out quite beautiful um, without, with just U's and V's, you know. And then if you go to the next screen, um, this started with Jesus and some petals. And then if you go to the next screen, you can see, what my what were my choices of uh, can you see Jana? What were the choices? Two choices I used, just lines and yes. circles. Even right? I can do lines and circles. Even, and, yeah, okay. And then go to the next one, and that's just more uh, you know more lines and circles. So you're, what you're really doing is you're creating your own prayer template, and you you know you can use it over and over again. You can like the the previous one where I had the names on it. You could use that for several days, adding names as you go or adding your own concerns. So it could even become what I call a hodgepodge prayer where you're adding, 
you know, whatever's on your mind. It might not be your you're not praying for somebody else. Maybe it's a, a gratitude list mm-hmm. or maybe you feel the need to confess. Anyway, you can just put all that stuff in, in that drawing while you're doing it. So at this, you're doodling, but you're creating your own template and your, you know, and your own sort of platform for prayer and, and words are fine. I, I never, people say, Oh, the, you like it. Cause it's no words. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't chase words away. I just don't make them, I don't force them anymore. And I just, I try to be a better listener than I used to be. Um, There's a wonderful comment here, Sybil, from um, an attendee who says that they have to leave the webinar, but wanted to say, this has been just excellent. I just finished a grad school course on art and prayer at the University of Toronto. Sybil is doing everything we talked about. Our professor recommended this webinar. I've ordered the book and really look forward to receiving it. Well, thank you, whoever that is <laughs> in Toronto. And there, here, there is a graduate level course on that. That's amazing. I know. I'm going to look it up when we're done here. That's fascinating. Another person says, um, Ellen says, how awesome. This is going back to the idea of um, praying in color during church. How awesome to invite a whole congregation to doodle through a sermon. There is research about the neurological value of doodling and retention just as Sybil is talking about, yes. Mm-hmm. I believe it. Um, and Miriam says, uh, sort of tying back to what you were just talking about, she says, do you pray in color for the birthday and wedding people too? Oh yeah, yeah, I do. Let me, let me see, I have, a, I have a birthday, my son just turned 40, which is a little freaky, but um, <laughs> <laughs> if you go to uh, number 29, this was kind of, and you know, people say, when you pray for somebody, do you send them the prayer? And I said, I'm real careful about that. It depends on whether they th- have asked me to pray for them. But you know, if one of my, if I'm praying for my kids and they don't necessarily want me to pray for them, <laughs> but this was a prayer for my son, Connor, and it's what I call a blessing prayer. And if you notice, it really follows that pattern. It's really just mostly just lines and arcs. Nothing fancier than that, you know, repeated lines. But, you know, there's things like, um, may the God of hope inspire you. May the God of joy delight you. May the God of strength protect you. May the God of sorrows comfort you. May the God of, I can't read my own, mystery surprise you. Um, and I, you know, what I have found is that it's actually increased my prayer vocabulary when I, to some extent, when I do that. Yeah. So yes, I, and I've done a lot of wedding, wedding prayers and a lot of condolence prayers too, because I just can't come up with the right words for people in loss, you know, when they've lost their, their family. So yeah, that is beautiful. Bit, yeah. Anyway. Well, and tying back to the whole idea of keeping these as sort of a spiritual prayer journal through the years, <clears throat> Helen says, um, reviewing your old doodle journal for people who die that you have prayed for, that you can remember those times and the joy of having had them in your life and the many times you prayed for them or prayed for guidance in situations that have resolved and how they resolved. So it's a real faith builder to go back and look at these over and over again. Yeah, That's so true. There's a woman from the who who is a part of the community of um, Jesus and Oblate who wrote me one time and she said I've just done my three thousandth prayer, <laughs> like she has prayed almost every day since since she first started doing it and she has these wonderful little uh, almost like cartoon characters that are are they're just I wish I had included one because they're real I mean it just shows that. You know, you don't have to doodle. If you like to draw things that look like things and you want to put your prayers in trees or leaves or boats or houses, that go at it. I don't do it because I can't, you know, that's not in my skill set. But um, there's certainly no reason that that, uh, you know, couldn't be an option. I love the stories of people making the practice their own. That's wonderful. And I can't believe that she's done 3,000 of them. That's uh, that's astonishing. Wow. Yeah. 
So Mary, Mary Ann Stafford here is just saying that she just wanted to mention that she uses praying in color with her grief support groups. It helps yes. people to mourn in a more tactile way and has been very successful for her. That's great to hear. Mary Ann did a, a guest blog post for me about two weeks ago. So if you want to go on my blog and look for it, it's been, that was a very nice um, thing that she did. And I was wrote that about, about mourning all the losses with the coronavirus of of things that we can't do anymore? Well, that you certainly could do that. This was a more, this was about um, when she lost her spouse, some one of the, and she has different activities, but this particular one was about uh, doing a prayer with all the remembrance of things that were uh, important and things she remembered about their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so go, go check it out. I can't tell you the exact date, but it's within the last couple weeks. Um, so along those lines, can you tell us a little bit more about what is new in this expanded edition? So there's a lot more material that wasn't in the first edition. Yeah. Well, I think partly it's more more ways to um, get started for the you know the art phobic, but also just different kinds of of of, of prayers and um, you know the, we talk about the basic prayer of what of uh, Thanksgiving and worship and uh, confession and intercession and petition, but this sort of expands it a little bit. What, um, I have one little section on praying your to-do list. Mm. As, you know, other, other ways to pray, praying a 12-step inventory. If you're in, you know, in a 12-step program, doing a fourth step with <clears throat> using praying in color <clears throat> has been helpful to some people. Um, so there's, you know, a little bit about scripture in there that, uh, you know, introducing that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, um, more examples. I, I think, um, um, and just what some of the things that I've learned in the process of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So. Fantastic. So well, this sort of ties back to what you were saying about um, the whole idea of stillness and being quiet and, and not feeling the need to flood yourself with words. Um, Jenny Long says, I loved Sybil's book about contemplative prayer, mainly because that practice was always way beyond my attention span. Could you speak a little more to that practice? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what she's, I, I, I haven't written a book about contemplative prayer, but I think of this as um, contemplative in some ways because you know, for me, prayer is not about multitasking. It's kind of the opposite. It's like bringing in, I'm, all, I'm always doing this. And I've always sort of prided myself on being multitasking. And what this does is it gathers all those piece, pieces of me, head, mind, body, and, and brings them together in a space, in a particular geography, and helps me to stay there. And the movement of my hand helps me not to get so distracted and I, I'm not, I, I, I sort of think of it as contemplative prayer, but it's certainly not contemplative in the, in the normal way. Um, I, I also, I, I've been a dancer my whole life and I was an athlete in high school and I'm very physical. So I, I will often do this in church and it's kind of like I'm davening, which is what the, the men who study Torah you know, do this. And I asked the, our local rabbi, I said, why do you think they're doing that? And he goes, well, they're bowing before the Lord. And I said, they're trying to stay awake because they're doing this like eight hours a day. They're studying scripture. But then I also had this image that as they were bowing before the scripture and the word, that the word was actually coming into their bodies. You know, it was like a way like the wave of your body and, and coming into you. So I think of that when I'm praying and using uh, my hand and, and, and getting still that way. It's the same thing that maybe through in some mystical way through my hands, through my, and, and my eyes seeing this, you know, engages my eyes. It engages a lot of things. And when I write words, it also brings that piece into it. Um, so it's sort of a full-bodied experience, but it doesn't feel like it's one of these full-body experiences. It feels like a, you know, an embracing sort of, um, a gathering in kind of full-body experience. Mm 
Yeah, I wonder if um, <clears throat> that person might have been referring to some of the books that go along with praying in color, like the contemplates wow. scripture in color. <laughs> Um, count your blessings though right. that little series that accompanies your books right which is actually was those drawings were not done by me but the the introductions were were done by me that's fantastic um lots of other questions here about um how much time you spend on each prayer page and do you do this every day i know you've already talked a little bit about that you know just Sometimes I do it when I'm in a meeting. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I'll do it at a restaurant. Sometimes I feel this need to spend a lot of time. So it, I, don't, I don't think there's one answer to that, but I think if you're just getting started and would like to try it, that sort of make, you know, start with 10 minutes or, or even just decide who you want to pray for. Or if you just want to sit with God and say, I'm going to do this for, 10 minutes and see what happens. Maybe it'll feel too long, maybe not. But when I do stuff in workshops and we use the three minute, so what I do is I get people to tell us a person they want us to pray for and one sentence about why. And then we pray all the whole group prays for that one person. And we do it for three minutes. And if I had to pray for somebody with words for three minutes or even just sit there and I would go nuts, but since I'm doing the drawing and then I keep looking at their name and keep imagining in them as in God's care, that that, the three minutes feels like nothing to me. So you could start and say, hey, I'm gonna use an egg timer or the timer on my phone. I'm gonna pray for this person for three minutes. Like, how do you know when you're done? You're done when the three minutes are done, <laughs> or at least for that sitting. So, you know, you craft stuff for yourself. It's not, you know, this isn't in the Bible, so we can't, you know, there's no scriptural uh, form for, and that really the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of uh, instruction about how to pray either. So, you know, you, you do know that some people in the Bible are praying, but other than the direct you know, giving of the Lord's Prayer, there's not a whole lot of specific instructions. That is a good point. Now, um, you just talked about, time limits and unfortunately we are coming up against our time limit in just a couple minutes here. Do you have some final thoughts about this that you would like to leave with people and uh, what you're hoping that this book will do in the world? Wow, I don't know that I have any, you know, I hope, you know, once recently somebody said, well, does your prayer form work? And I was like, oh, <laughs> what do you mean by that? Do you, does that mean that all the people I pray for get better or that nobody dies or that somebody gives up their addiction and their life turns around? No, my prayer form does not work. I mean, sometimes that those things happen. But what I've decided that it means is that I'm less of a snarly, grumpy, depressed human being for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then my prayer form works for me. So that, <laughs> that that's what, you know. If, if I'm a DC human and I love others and love God better than I did when I started, then my prayer form works. Uh, but I also see things happen that they're not my doing, but mm. you know, healing, as a friend of my, as my priest friend Mary says, whenever you pray for healing, healing always takes place. What the healing is, we don't, is not always evident, but healing always takes place. Okay. Uh, one more quick question that just came in, which is, um, is there ever going to be an app for our phones, a praying in color app? You know, we talked about that a long time ago. And, and I think there's so many good, <clears throat> in, in the book, there are actually some examples of iPad prayers and, you know, Sketch Pro and all, whatever the, they're, they're always new and wonderful art apps. And, I, you know, I have done prayers in those apps on and uh, it's certainly a viable way to do it. So whether, I, I'm not sure having its own at this point, it might've missed its, its uh, time because there are so many wonderful art, art making apps okay. out there. We'll have to get our tech team to do some research. <laughs> <laughs>
There are so many more um, questions and comments. Um, a, a lot of expressions of gratitude, Sybil. Um, Sherry Smith wrote about the prayer that you had done for her specifically when she was grieving. Lisa Durant says, I've used this way to pray since getting your book many years ago. It has been a wonderful way for me to spend time with God. I've introduced it to children and teens in my religious ed classes and to adults at a convocation in my archdiocese. I've now expanded to using it for Lexio Divina and I'm amazed when I look back and see how scripture becomes the living word. Thank you so much for introducing me to this practice. And Lexio Divina is in, is in the book. And I, I sort of morphed how, how from the first book to this book, it's, I like how I do it now better. <laughs> There are lots of questions too on um, when will you be doing me. workshops again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, please feel free everyone to, to get in touch with Sybil via her website or um, you can write to me, Rachel M at paracletepress.com. There's lots of questions about sharing pages, um, resources for groups. So feel free to get in touch with Sybil or with Paraclete and we can help you work that out. Um, and I'll just, you know, again, we could probably go on <laughs> for quite a long time as the comments keep coming in, but I'm, I'm sorry, we do have to end for this morning. Um, just an immense thank you to you, Sybil, and to Jana for spending this time with us this morning. It's Praying in Color is clearly continuing to meet huge needs for people all over the world. Just this morning, we have people from all over the U.S., from Canada, from Ireland, the U.K., South Africa. Um, praying in color is a far reaching, wonderful, wonderful way to pray. So thank you for sharing your hearts with us, both of you. Um, this event will be available on YouTube later today and then only for two weeks after that. So please tell people who were unable to attend um, to see it there soon. I've been posting links in the chat bar, which you'll also get an email reminding you, but um, all the praying in color books are available from your local booksellers and from Paraclete Press at the link you see there. If you use the coupon code COLOR, you'll receive 20% off of all those books today. And actually that special is extended to all of the books in our active prayer series. Again, you can find all those books at the link listed over in the chat bar on our website, paracletepress.com. And also free shipping is available this month on orders over $45. We ask you to please consider gifting the Praying in Color books to your friends and family, your book club, perhaps any small group that you might belong to at church or at school. Your generosity will help support Sybil and Paraclete Press in our ongoing work and providing free webinars like this one today. We hope you enjoyed this time together as much as we did. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety, and we hope you'll join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of Zoom events is available on our website, paracletepress.com, and also look for information about upcoming online retreats that Paraclete is going to be hosting. We're really excited about that. So thank you again, Jana and Sybil. God bless you. I don't know if you have any further comments for us before we have to sign off. No, thank you. This was thank you, Rachel, Jana, Dan, Katie, whoever made this possible. Wonderful. Thank you. We're really happy that you were with us today. So oh, I wanted to show this is, I got nervous right before we were doing this. So I did a prayer for all of us that were doing. Oh, look at <laughs> Wonderful.